Hey everyone, this is um, my second video and uh, hopefully it's a little bit better than the video yesterday or maybe you find um, little pieces of information in this that um, you can grab onto and take with you at your uh, next conversational passing or Zoom call. Um, but what I wanted to do today was talk about um, a place that I was supposed to be going um, before this COVID situation happened, which was the Loire Valley. So, um, yeah, I was supposed to be there in about a month from now, uh, give or take, and I'm um, spending a little time to kind of go through the region and um, taste the area, and unfortunately not going to be there. So, the research is already done, and uh, I thought it would be cool to share some of that with you. Um, on a very top-level scale, I don't want to get too deep into some of um, the grapes and the soils and the area and everything, because I just want you to be able to kind of grab hold of um, some of the top level information as it really relates to what you have accessibility for at your local grocery store or at your Total Wine or wherever it is that you're shopping. I want you to feel um, a little bit more knowledgeable about some of these uh, grapes and regions because the French label can be pretty scary um, in particular. So i uh, got my glass of uh, Chardonnay here, um, which is not one of the grapes that we're talking about today, but I figured I would um, pour a... Uh, a white burgundy today um, but uh, yeah so let's kind of get into it right um, there's five regions in France that everyone knows very well um, Champagne Burgundy Bordeaux and the Rhone Valley um, and then the last one is Loire which is probably one of the lesser known um, over the last 30 or 40 years but I figured it'd be really good to talk about uh, regions in the valley so um, there's the central Loire Valley itself um, there's uh, Touraine, um, there's Anjou, Semur, and then there's the Pay Nanti. I probably butchered that because I'm not a French study, um, but I do like French wine, so I'll drink it rather than speak it and leave that to somebody else. Um, but really the big focus here is Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin Blanc. These are going to be the easiest to, to find uh, in your liquor stores, but um, yeah, so if you're out and about and you're uh, in the Loire Valley section or you're in the Sauvignon Blanc section in the, in the grocery store or liquor store, take a look for um, Loire Valley. I think you'll be, you'll be pretty happy. Um, some of the flavors of the Sauvignon Blanc that come from this area are green fruits, which I think we touched on yesterday, um, and vegetation. Things like uh, gooseberry, elderflower, uh, green bell pepper, um, asparagus actually, um, and um, you'll, you'll actually start picking up on those the more that you smell them. And getting back to one of the things we talked about yesterday about um, kind of building up your smell aromas is really important. So it's going to sound really silly, but the next time that you go in the refrigerator and you're grabbing something, pick up that bell pepper, give it a good smell. Um, the red, the green, the yellow, try to identify in your mind different smells between the three of them. Pick up the, uh, the asparagus, pick up the onion. Um, that may, may make you cry, so don't pick up the onion. But um, <laughs> look at, at building out the um, flavor senses um, in your nose, in your mouth, as you kind of taste these things. Try to remember them, because it'll help when you're going through the tasting of wines themselves. So um, I digress. Um, the Sauvignon Blanc grape itself is really high in acidity. Um, it's typically almost always dry, and it has a medium body to it. Um, and Sauvignon Blanc really needs a cool climate the hotter the climate, um, really the less complex the wine can be. So Loire Valley is a really great area for this uh, particular grape to grow. Uh, the Loire River itself is one of the longest rivers in France. Uh, I had to look this up, but it's 630 miles long. Um, and I drew a map and it's terrible. Um, and you're never gonna be able to see it because of how this camera is set up but you can see that this is basically the Atlantic Ocean over here and the Loire River flows all the way through, splits off in tours, and then goes two different directions through the rest of France. And there's tons of um, tributaries and small rivers and pass-throughs um, that expand out from this particular river, but 630 miles is, is crazy. Um, one of the coolest things about the Loire Valley um, is the castles and the grand chateaus in the valley. Um, they all stand today really just pay tribute to the renaissance that happened in art and culture, architecture and cuisine um, that was happening 
um, the 15th, the 16th, the 17th centuries in France, um, and, and um, kind of going back to, um, it was Louis XIV uh, that actually had a big castle uh, down there. Um, in that area was really big for uh, summer retreat for different types of royalty. So if you have some time, I would definitely go back and um, get your history education from somebody other than me. Um, but check online, and it's it's really cool to um, to to see the different things that were happening in uh, the French Renaissance uh, down in Loire. Um, the Loire Valley itself um, is actually called the Garden of France, which is really cool. Um, it's the third most visited area in France behind Paris, obviously number one, and the Côte d'Azur, um, number two. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you're supposed to be going down there to, to visit and to taste, and there's a couple of things that you should absolutely do when you're there, which is go castle visiting. Um, there's a couple of them that I had done some research on and I'll definitely talk about. Um, but since you're sitting at home in front of a computer, check out these castles, see if you can do any type of online tours or even just look at the pictures because the gardens here are unbelievably gorgeous. Um, the uh, Chateau Villandre was um, one that was on our list. It was the last castle that was built during the Renaissance in Loire, which is really cool. Um, the garden that they have in this place is unbelievable. Um, it's just acres and acres of a massive castle and gardens. It's beautiful. Um, the Chateau du Clos Lucet um, is actually a really cool historic castle. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci stayed here. He met, uh, don't quote me, but I think it's Henry IV um, when he was out and about. Actually stayed there for three years before he died. Um, and so there's a small museum inside the, um, the castle itself. And you can actually see uh, da Vinci's original machine gun, helicopter, and paddle boat um, prototypes where he was doing some of his best work just before he died. Um, another castle is called Chateau Doucet, um, and if you're familiar with uh, Charles um, Perrault, which I am not, but I looked this up again to give you some more information as we were traveling, um, this particular castle was actually inspired um, this writer to write Sleeping Beauty. So a lot of um, Disney influence comes from this particular region, which is really cool. Um, and then the last one that we looked at that we were supposed to visit was the Chambord Castle. This is one of the more famous ones there. Um, during World War II, it actually housed some of France's most valuable treasures. And um, one thing that I didn't know uh, was that the Mona Lisa was actually held there during World War II, um, hidden in secrecy. So um, really cool. Um, again, I would urge you to go and check out some of these castles, even if you're not interested in the wine, just being able to go there and visit um, is, is actually something um, I would encourage you to do. Um, so the first region we'll talk about um, is the uh, this area right here closest to the Atlantic? It's the Pénantie, um, and very very simple region to talk about. There's not too much going on here that you're really going to be able to have a lot of accessibility at the liquor store. Um, but short, long and short of this is in 1709, um, this frost came in and killed all of the red wine in the region. Um, so Louis the Fourteenth brought over um, the Malone de Bourguignon, which is basically a white grape from Burgundy. And um, the locals here said that it had kind of this musky flavor, and so the name stuck. Um, so the musket grape there is not actually the musket grape. It's actually uh, a white grape from Burgundy. So um, it does not have the same flavor profile structure um, taste as the actual muscadet grape that you'll find in other regions. Um, this particular grape itself has a very subtle grassy and citrus note. Um, like everything in the Loire Valley, it's got high acidity um, and it's really good for fresh seafood. Obviously being right there on the coast, um, you can only imagine the type of food that is coming out of there. It's uh, beyond. Um, so I'm a little un unfortunate not going to make it there this year, but definitely next year we'll be back um, to try that. The next region um, is called Anjou. And uh, is just uh, next to um, Penante. And what you're going to find here is mostly rosés and red wines, um, a few nice whites, some sparkling. The reds here are predominantly made from Cab Franc, um, Cab Sauve. Um, there's a grape called uh, Gru uh, 
Groal. Gro, it's it's G R O L L E A U. Again, my French is terrible. Um, you're probably not going to find that one in the grocery store um, or a total. But again, I would go back to the Cab Franc and the Cab Sauv. Um, there's a grape called Cot, uh, C O T, which is actually just Malbec. Um, so you may find that there. I would recommend Malbec from Argentina, or I would recommend Malbec from Cahors, which is further south, um, just to the east of, of uh, Bur uh, Bordeaux. So I would probably recommend going with Malbecs from there. Um, but these are great as well. You'll see some of those for blending. But check out the Cab Franc from this particular area. It's going to be your, your best bet. Um, and then there's another um, type of wine that you can find here called the Rosé d'Anjou. Um, this is equivalent to like a French white Zin. Um, so as the rosé category continues to become more expensive um, and more white uh, rosés, um, not white rosés, but more rosés come into the category and you're kind of like bombarded and you're like, oh, I'm so sick of French Provence rosés, um, you could go there and, and grab a bottle of rosé d'Anjou for 10 to 15 bucks. Um, it's going to have a medium plus quality to it. It may not be as good as a Provence rosé, but it's a good um, bottle to have. It's great for the summertime. It's super fresh um, and it's easy drinking. You don't have to age it. You sit on it, you grab it, you go. Um, and the white wines in this particular region are pretty much made from Chenin Blanc, right? So um, those are the two regions I think were a little bit simpler to get into. And then I'm going to jump into um, another region called Touraine. So this was one of the places that we had an Airbnb set up and we were supposed to stay here uh, so I put a little circle here this is uh, Tours and just where the circle is is Anglers um, and that's kind of where the um, Loire River breaks off um, but Tours is again a beautiful city um, there's a climate change that happens here and this area is a little bit more continental climate so you're gonna get a little bit hotter summer a little bit cooler winter um, it's not as much of a maritime climate as you're gonna find um, closer to the coastline in the Atlantic the entire region of the Loire Valley is called the Garden of France, but this region in particular is really more so um, uh, targeted towards being more gardens than anywhere else. It's covered in flowers, fruits, and vegetables. Um, there's livestock. There's cheese. If you love cheese, um, there's, I don't know, 10, 15 different types of cheese um, that you can find in that particular arena. Um, and the countryside itself is gorgeous. It's covered by rivers. There's um, tributaries that are going all throughout there. It's great for just lounging and fishing. Um, and just about every Airbnb over there has got a river in its backyard. So um, it's a gorgeous area. There's two subregions in this area. One is called Shinon and um, one is called Borgayu. Um, the spelling on that is B-O-U-R-G-U-E-I-L. Um, another one of those French difficult pronunciations, um, but I wanted to just kind of touch on Chinon in particular. Um, that area is very, very well known. Um, Cab Franc is the grape that grows best here uh, for red wines um, because of a little bit of a cooler climate. Um, those wines tend to be medium, light bodied. Uh, you get some nice red fruits there, red currant, raspberry. We talked about cedar as one of the wood aromas yesterday. That's going to come out. You're going to get some green pepper coming through. Um, and Cab Franc in particular with green pepper is a flavor that's very synonymous um, with that grape varietal. So when you start tasting grapes, uh, Cab Franc grapes from other regions, you'll notice some of that green pepper coming through. And when you're doing a blind tasting, that'll help you pick up on, hey, that might be Cab Franc um, as you kind of investigate the wine. The um, other wine that you'll find in this area um, is a famous white called Vouvray. Um, this area is dominated by the Chenin Blanc grape. So actually what I did here too is, uh, again, you're probably gonna have trouble seeing it, especially given that it's backwards, um, but you've got the Chenin Blanc grape, um, C-H-E-I-N-I-N. -I -N. Um, that's the name of the grape itself. And then you've got Chinon, which is the actual region. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that there's a differentiation there between the, the two of those. Um, most of the wines um, that you're going to find from Chenin Blanc are medium bodied. They've got a medium level of sweetness, um, good, good high acidity, citrus and tropical fruits, which make this very approachable. 
to get things like lemon, apple, pineapple. Um, you get a little bit of a green leaf kind of herbaceousness. Um, and then you can also find uh, a sweeter version, um, a slightly sweeter version, and then also a sparkling um, in Vouvray. The way that those are typically derived from the winemaker is based on acidity. So like the very sweet version is going to have a higher acidity, the slightly sweeter is going to have less, and then the sparkling, because they are not quite ripe and they're not quite good enough to go into the sweeter version, they just dump them all um, into a sparkling wine, um, and that's what you're left with in, uh, in Vouvray. So um, the last uh, two areas um, that are part of the Central Loire Valley, which is... The map is completely turned around and I'm so sorry that I did this. Um, but this is the Central Loire down here. So these are the last two areas. Um, you can go on Google Maps and you could look this up. You can pick up a book. It's it's easy to see. So my apologies on that. But um, Poulet Fumé and Sancir, best two regions in the whole Loire Valley, in my opinion, um, because of the Sauvignon Blanc grape quality here. Um, and there's a certain amount of romanticism in Sancir in particular. Um, one of the best things about traveling specifically to research or to taste or to just experience wine is how you get to see how um, the terroir, um, the topography, the climate, um, the, the people all start to influence these grapes. So when you go to these regions and you're standing at the top of a valley and you're looking down and you're like, oh, that actually makes sense. I see that the wind is being blocked by this giant mountain and so uh, you're getting warmer air coming down here instead of the cooler air coming from the coast. That makes sense. And then you start to kind of put all the pieces together and you're like, I get it. Which is a lot harder to do when you got an idiot showing you a backwards map. But, um, you know, it's, it's uh, one of those things that I would encourage everybody to do. So um, the Loire Valley, uh, Loire River, excuse me, as it's kind of coming through that area, um, is on the West Bank, um, and that's where Sancir is. And really only in the last 40 or 50 years has this wine really started to make an impact around the world um, and become a wine list um, and in stores. And unfortunately, the more popular it gets, the more expensive it gets. So sometimes you can see Sancirs in a pricier position, um, but you can get them at really great price points. Um, 25 bucks, 30 bucks, um, some of the good stuff's around 40, 45, but um, I wouldn't pay more than $70 for a bottle of Sincere. I think that's getting too high for Sauvignon Blanc, but um, $40 is about the sweet spot there. Um, these wines are really known for concentrated flavors, intense aromas, um, so I would definitely encourage you to go out and try to find a bottle of Sincere. Again, Sincere is Sauvignon Blanc um, in France. Um, there's lots of small vineyards here. Most of them are owned by small growers, which is very cool. Um, the area itself is about 5,000 acres, um, so it's very small, but there is a lot of small growers. Um, Puli Fume itself is actually on the eastern bank, so the other side of the Loire River. Um, what's interesting here is that the name Fume does not refer to smoke or the flavor of the wine. Um, some people say that there is a hint of flint in there, F-L-I-N-T, um, but it's really, again, and this is all subjective, but they say that the name Fumé comes from the foggy smoke um, that's over top of the vineyards in the early morning, and as the mist burns off, you get this kind of beautiful, smoky look. Um, and some people say that's where the name came from, but um, there is a difference between Puli Fumé um, and Puli Fusse. So um, it's always good to know. Um, and then in terms of grape varietal, the difference, um, Puli Fumé, which we're talking about here, um, is 100% Sauvignon Blanc. And then Puli Fusse, which is what I'm drinking now, um, this is from the Macanay region in Burgundy, um, is 100% Chardonnay. So um, those are two good things to know the difference of when you're looking at the um, labels in the, in the store because it will not say Sauvignon Blanc and very rarely will it say Chardonnay. Now, um, not to get into Burgundy, but uh, Louis Latour does a good job on the back of their bottle. Um, they're very Americanized, so they'll actually say Chardonnay on the bottle. Um, so you can feel comfortable that with a Poulet Fousset, you're picking up a bottle of Chardonnay. So there's that. 
Um, the soil content um, in Sancir and in Puli Fume are two of the things that really make this particular region special. Um, it's a mixture of limestone and clay, and there's a soil content here called Kimmeridgian clay, uh, which is a really cool word to say, but it's even cooler when you start to think about the history of what Kimmeridgian clay actually is. Um, it's fossilized crustaceans that add minerality to, um, to that soil, and then that leads to a greater acidity and fruit balance in the wine. So um, again, one of those google Google-able words, Kimmeridgian, um, is one of those things to spend two, three minutes checking it out and you'll see what um, some of that fossilized clay uh, looks like. Um, and it just makes me think of like Jurassic Park um, about the evolution of, of how that soil um, has changed over time and you've got all these amazing um, minerality crustaceans that are kind of buried in that soil and the grapevines grow down there and pull that back up into the, um, into the, the grape itself. Um, so that's really everything that I have on Loire. I wanted to try to keep this short and I still managed to get to 20 minutes, so my apologies on that, but, um, I hope you enjoyed this little bit of rambling that I had for you today, um, and my backwards maps. Again, apologize for that. Uh, if there's anything that you want me to cover or anything that you want me to talk about in particular, let me know. Um, and other than that, uh, cheers. Have a good one.